to introduce two people, Dr. Barbara Ransby and Dr. Rod Ferguson, who remind us through their scholarship and activism that movements for social justice and community organized think have always included a deep commitment to intellectual thinking and that so much of our work on campuses and within the academy is also the result of activism and struggle. Um, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. This sentiment, that is a beautiful quote by Arundhati Roy, is something that comes to mind when I think of the work of Rod Ferguson and Barbara Ransby. These are fiercely urgent times in which we live, and it's, it's so easy to become cynical and to also be skeptical, and so much of our scholarly work is demands that we be cynical and skeptics through the analysis, critique, and reflection where we're asked to articulate what we are against. But the work of Barbara Ramsey and Rod Ferguson also commits an equal amount of time and energy and passion to articulating what we are for. Their work unleashes our radical imaginations about the world that we are collectively creating for all of us. Rod Ferguson is a professor of African American Studies and Gender and Women's Studies at UIC and also runs the Racialized Body Cluster there. He served as the Associate Editor of American Quarterly, the Journal of the American Studies Association, and is the recipient of the Modern Language Association's Compton Knoll Award, which awards the best essay in lesbian, gay, and queer studies in modern languages. He is also the co-editor with Grace Hong of Difference Incorporated, and also with Hong, the anthology Strange Affinities, the Gender and Sexual Politics of Comparative Racialization. And he has written really two extraordinary books, um, one, Aberrations in Black Toward a Queer Color of Critique, and also The Reorder of Things, the Universities and its Pedagogies of Minority <coughs> Differences, which we really want to spend some time talking about today because um, he has really challenged us to think about how um, disciplines and ethnic studies and gender women studies have been constituted within the academy and sort of how do we really challenge uh, power. Barbara Ramsey is a historian, writer, and longtime activist. She's also a member of the National Advisory Board of Imagine America. She's a distinguished professor of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where she directs the campus-wide social justice initiative. Barbara is the author of the highly acclaimed biography, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, which is a book that has received eight national awards and recognitions. And her most recent book is Atlanta, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. Barbara was also an initiator of the African American Women in Defense of Ourselves campaign in 1991, a co-convener of the Black Radical Congress, and a founder of Ella's Daughters, a network of women working in Ella Baker's tradition. Her articles have appeared in you know, all the important scholarly journals, but also appears in popular presses like the Miami Herald, the Detroit Free Press, and these times, and the Progressive. Both of Barbara's books um, look at world historical moments, but tell these stories through the eyes of black radical women. Very, very excited to invite them to this IA stage where they're going to grace us with their presence. I'm happy to introduce their work, but also I'm happy to introduce them because they're my friends and colleagues. Please join me in welcome. <laughs> well, we're happy to we're happy to be here. Um, we um, love and adore our colleague Lisa Lee, and we um, always say yes when she asks us to do things. But um, we also I am very invested in imagining America, and um, so happy to see all the changes that are happening. And the, the wonderful staff and leadership has really carried this organization in important ways, pushing back against the kind of neoliberalism that's overtaking many of our institutions. And I'm honored to be on stage with uh, my great colleague, Rod Ferguson. If I am Yeah. <laughs> we disagree sometimes. But we're going to try to have a 45 minute conversation about our work and things that are on our mind and hopefully things that are interesting to, to you all. So thank you for being here.
right, um, I'm not sure, did we decide to start first? Or yes, you are. I'm going to start first. All right. Mm -hmm. So we just imagine this as a you know, conversation about the work that we've been doing um, you know, over the years, but also uh, to think about that work in relation to the topic of imagining America, but also the topic of where is the university. Now, with that um, in mind, I wanted to begin, Barbara, by uh, asking you to talk a bit about the new work that you're doing with the Reparations for Higher Education uh, Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, you just came back from uh, Providence. I did. Yes. So it's a, um, I keep forgetting what we call it, but it's, um, it's a working group on reparations in higher education. and. Um, we, before I talk about that, let me just kind of give a little bit of backstory because, um, you know, my own work and my my work in the academy has always been a little bit ambivalent, right? So um, I have always looked for projects um, that bridge university and community that allow me to bring my politics a little bit into the space of the university. Although I, I I always feel it's important to keep the locus of my political work and life outside the university. Um, and so this is a continuation of a lot of projects that I've been involved in over the years, from the Baker Mandela Center at the University of Michigan, which was a similar uh, effort to, um, to bring activists into university spaces to tap the reservoirs of knowledge and community um, and so forth. But I think in this, in this work, in particular on reparations in higher ed, is really trying to address this crisis moment in, um, in higher education where you know, we see um, administrators at so many institutions really with no moral compass, you know, really becoming more like corporations, um, making no apologies for referring to our students as you know, consumers and clients rather than you know, young people you know, trying to figure the world out and hopefully to change it. Um, and particularly this moment of denial around race and racism, um, I think is important. So the um, working group on reparations in higher ed involves uh, scholars and activists and students from about 12 campuses. We had our first meeting at, uh, at Brown just literally yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, and we've had some phone meetings, but partly inspired by the situation at Georgetown, which came to the forefront of public um, awareness. I think people probably saw a front page of the Washington Post where um, they discovered, now this really was an open secret, right? Like, they discovered, my gosh, you know, that um, Jesuit priests had sold 230 some slaves um, in order to uh, make the institution financially solvent, right? Now, an alumni heard about this in, in the 1830s. Uh, an alumni heard about this in Washington Research Project and um, uh, one thing led to another, and there was a working group at Georgetown that's just recently come out with a report that's pro proposing some, some kind of reparations, ever so modest. Uh, but many of us felt both well, that attempt, and even the, the, the effort at Brown, which was um, with better, uh, was initiated by Ruth Simmons, the first black president of Brown, um, had attempted to reconcile Brown's relationship to slavery, the way in which Brown had benefited from slavery. They set up a, um, a uh, Slavery and Justice Center, which my friend and colleague Tony Bowles heads up now, and that's where we met. Um, but it only went part of the way down the road. And I think we see now with the movement for Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, a resurgent interest in understanding the nature of structural racism, which you know I'm a historian, so that means understanding history. Uh, so this group is about really looking at not just a single institution, but looking at the ways in which the university and the academy in general has been implicated in white supremacy and racism. Yeah. Slavery is one chapter in that. The Baryan Baldwin's work about gentrification um, speaks to another chapter. So we're, we're, we're writing a report that will hopefully be signed by a number of scholars around the country that will kind of expose that connection and challenge universities to address it. You know, Stan, this is a bit, you know, one of the interesting things about the um, response to Georgetown, especially from the president, was that the descendants of the slaves will get, you know, um, I don't know what you call it, like additional consideration for admittance <laughs> to the university, <laughs> but that um, there was no conversation around um, scholarships. <coughs> there was conversation, it just wasn't. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there was no movement yeah. Right, yeah. around that, even though 
the discovery was actually about how much of uh, Georgetown's own, you know, largest yeah. resources was constituted by slave labor. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's a, an, an obvious, inexcusable flaw in this response. I mean, a lot of the responses have been, "This is coming to light. Let's see how we can dress it up." Right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. How. And interestingly, in the Georgetown case. Um, not only is it not any kind of transfer of wealth, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's also based on the kind of legacy model. Yeah. You know, they're going to give extra points to the descendants of the slaves yeah. the same way that they give extra points to, to you know, care. yeah, wealthy alumni yeah. who have gone there in, in the past. So yeah, very, very limited. I mean, one, it's, there's a limit also in focusing just on the individuals, right? Yeah. The yeah. Individual uh, families, as opposed to the structures okay, and the systemic right. nature of the problem. So right. that's what hopefully we'll address in this document. Right, okay. Let's move on to, you know, the sort of broad question of leadership, which, you know, uh, is embedded in the work that you do in general, but also in, you know, I take it, you know, part of what reparations for higher education is also trying to model, you know, a different you know, sort of schema for what it means to be leaders within the trouble academic scene now. One of the ways in which I read both of your books is that they, you know, provide us a glimpse, you know, like also a kind of map of the sort of um, leadership strategies that are under acknowledged partly because, you know, these are black women, you know, whose you know, participation period is under acknowledged in um, <coughs> movement histories and stuff. Can you talk a bit about um, you know, what kind of leadership models do you know, folks like Von Rosen and Earl Baker provide for us and why is it necessary now? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll answer, I'll answer um, differently for, for each of them. I mean, I think, um, for me, biography is important uh, because it shows us how imperfect people, uh, or ordinary people in some cases, uh, uh, make do extraordinary things and make history, and how flawed people um, manage to um, make enormous impact on movements and on history. And, and these women are, are examples of that. For, in, in terms of Ella Baker, I mean, she's been an enormous influence on my own understanding of the importance of grassroots, decentralized, woman-centered leadership. Um, and I think I've been very pleased and hopeful that I, I see this phase of the Black Freedom Movement as really paying a lot of attention mm -hmm. to that tradition. It's not just Ella Baker's tradition, but it's a tradition that moves away from a kind of charismatic, a male charismatic model um, of leader, a savior model of leader. Um, it invests in enormous confidence in the ability of ordinary people to solve their own problems. And this was Ella Baker's model. Now, I've also written about this in ways I think it can be misunderstood yeah. as leaderlessness. Yeah. It can be misunderstood as structurelessness, you know, that, that you know, sort of anarchy will save us. And you know, no offense to the anarchists, I've been on, you know, in demonstrations with anarchists, and at times we're happy that they were there. They're wonderful. They were there. However, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm not saying all that, but. <laughs> Ella Baker believed in leadership, but she believed in a certain kind of leadership. Um, and, you know, Lisa was reminding me of this article I wrote for Color Lines a while ago, um, which they titled Ella Taught Me. And basically, I, I, I warn against the tyranny of structurelessness. You know, there's a way in which we can say, oh, we don't, you know, we don't really need organization. We'll just organically figure it out. Well, the default will be someone will become the spokesperson. And it may be someone with no accountability to movement. Right? Someone will, you know, sort of step forward. Uh, decisions will get made, even if we don't have a strategy and a formula for how to make them, right? They will get made. Um, and that's not necessarily the fairest and most democratic way. So, um, so, so I think understanding how Elevator balanced the desire for inclusion, centering the most oppressed in our communities with the need for structure and the need for leadership. And that's you know, I think that's true in all, I try to remember that in all the work I do. Um, part of this work with, um, you know, within the academy, kind of intellectual work that's on the borders of the academy, is also to do it outside of the reward system of the university, you know. Um, 
So these are not committees that one gets appointed to. It's like you find it in the crevices of your, you know, of your calendar, time to do it. So, um, so yeah, that's 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 my first. Now with Aslana Robeson, I mean, my biggest lesson from her, she really wasn't an organizer, uh, but she was an internationalist. And um, again, the way that I see. Uh, her tradition carried forward in the movement today is that, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of underrated and not acknowledged, but Movement for Black Lives is, is an international movement. You know, there's a UK BLM chapter, Black Youth Project 100 has had, you know, people in delegations to, to Palestine, to um, Brazil, uh, and, um, and so forth. So there's, there is a sense of, a, of an African diaspora and that this movement is in the context of that. If Islanda Robeson, People may not be familiar with her. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, she was a, uh, an anti-colonial activist uh, who traveled all over, and an anthropologist who traveled all over the world, arguing for liberation of, of, of Africa and, and a radical pan-Africanism, also uh, feminist. And um, she saw her own identity as a black woman as very much tied into a global um, analytic, right? So, um, so I, I see that in internationalism. Today. Do you want to talk a bit about, I mean, you know, and staying with this, do you want to talk a bit about, you know, what then is the role of black feminism in, in those movements then, but also now? You know, one of the things that, you know, I've always found just so inspiring about um, uh, the history of black women in the civil rights movement, or if you're talking about an, an Africanist movement, you know, is the way in which, you know, there is a real kind of emphasis on relationality, you know, the global, um, you know, the way in which you know, racial capitalism is also a gender, you know, enterprise. So I wonder if you want to maybe um, reflect on the status of black feminism then and now. Yes. I will. <laughs> something I think about a lot, and then I, and then I get to ask you some questions. Yes. Um, Rod's getting comfortable in his interview. I am. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. I have a question in the bar. I only have answers to four questions. Okay. I'll reach in a minute. I only gave her four questions. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, it's, it's different, right, than the, the historical periods that I study, um, civil rights and black freedom movement, or even going back further to Slanda Rosen's time, and you always had uh, black women who were involved in struggle of various types, right? Uh, giving leadership, we can think of back to Ida B. Wells and the anti-lynching crusade and, and, and women's rights, and also as one of the founders of the NAACP, but always having to fight for her right to, uh, to be at the podium, to be in the forefront, and so forth. Today it's different, and people are still fighting around um, sexism and homophobia inside the movement. People are fighting around who gets to speak for the movement um, and all of that. But this, the, the significance of this moment, I think, and I think we should um, savor it and, and really hold it for a minute, is the first time you've had a large number of black feminists, unapologetically black feminists, many of them queer, at the forefront of the cutting edge issue of the black freedom movement. Yeah. Not, not just not gender issues or um, uh, queer issues alone, but at the cutting edge, at the center, right, of the main issue in the black community. And trans, and trans, yeah. Well, there, there are trans politics uh, that are in the mix, and I think there's still a struggle to be as inclusive as the movement is committed to on paper of including trans folks. So yes, and, and even that that's on the table and in the dialogue, and, and there are, you know, in, in all the organizations, trans folks who are, who are playing an important role. Yeah, so I think that's very significant. Um, and, and that history is important. Next year will be the 40th anniversary of the Combehee River Collective. Now the Combehee River Collective uh, statement is probably one of the most important black feminist manifestos of the 20th century. Um, people have taught it, people have organized around it, been inspired by it. Um, and it is a document that is an anti-capitalist document, it is an anti-imperialist document. Uh, so it is, so for those folks who would argue that black feminism is a narrowing uh, of, of a political vision, um, or somehow an identity group or a, you know, a special interest group, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it really reflects that people aren't paying attention to the politics because the politics have always been expansive, radical, and inclusive. Not everyone, not all of them, but, but the documents and the voices that have been the most influential in black feminist circles have articulated that kind of vision. Yeah. So we're talking about doing work in the university, we're talking about movement work, and when we think of the 60s and 70s, one of the things that comes out of the 1970s is the fight for black studies, Latino studies, uh, eventually Asian American studies, indigenous studies, women's studies. Um, and you write in your new book, The Reorder of Things, about the changing terrain of the university. Those of us who are navigating it, right, there are pitfalls, landmines, there's a very treacherous terrain that we're navigating, and a lot of efforts, some of them successful, at co-optation of some of the interdisciplinary programs that came out of struggle. Can you say a little bit about, or not just a little bit, can you say a lot <laughs> about how you see the university at this moment um, uh, as, you know, as we map you know, kind of strategies for activism in the university? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, to get some context, um, I wrote that book. It was actually a book that I didn't intend to write. It was a book that I wrote. Glad you did. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was a book that I wrote after I got tenure. I was working on a different book. And the thing that I started noticing was that I would get almost 15 minutes, no lie, after I got the email from my then chair that I got tenure, right? I would get there was an email, the first email said, will you consider being the director of this institute? And another email, will you consider being the chair of this department? And another email, will you consider being the director of undergraduate studies in America? You know, and so I thought, this is interesting. You know, this is a, you know, here I am, you know, this sort of black queer guy, um, you know, being asked to represent the university, right? And then also thinking of the ways in which, you know, some of the colleagues of mine, you know, who are women of color, um, other minorities, were also getting similar solicitations, right? And, um, you know, so I wanted to sort of think about, okay, what is that as a kind of historical moment where people who, you know, at one point you couldn't even say that you were queer or another, point, you know, to sort of, you know, claim feminism was, you know, would have been a tattoo thing. But now, you know, we're the folks who are serving as a kind of surplus administrative army, you know, for, <laughs> for the university, right? And, um, you know, and I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. Uh, and all these other folks who are writing about the university, you know, really in a kind of conventional Marxist. You know, they, and, you know, Marxism is one of the places that I come out of, but, you know, there were just things that just didn't make sense, you know, to me in terms of, um, no one's actually, you know, talking about the role of interdisciplinary, you know, formation or the, uh, the women's movement, the ethnic studies movement, the civil rights, the black power, the Rasa, you know, the Asian American movement on, what the university has become, right? So that was one thing. And then the other thing is that I had originally thought, oh, okay, well, I'll write, you know, a book that just incorporates, you know, those elements into the university's corporation, blah, 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 you know, still being, you know, in some way the kind of conventional Marxist, but one who does stuff on race and gender and sexuality. And then the more Michael stuff I, you know, did on, the, on that project, I realized that, uh, you know, it's not like corporations knew what they were doing with minority culture and minority difference. You know, like in some, some way, you know, this was borne out in the, um, you know, the, the archival stuff with, you know, heads of corporations who were learning from, you know, the uh, counterculture movements were saying that, like, you know, oh, we're learning this from Ho Chi Minh, so mm -hmm. says the, Vice President of Ava Smith, right? Or McDonald's, you know, saying, oh, you know, we can actually sell black people if we, you know, have a commercial with, you know, black kids playing double dutch. <laughs> um, or the Coca-Cola ad, the famous one, you know, I'd like to buy the world of Coke. Mm -hmm. uh, the one on the hillside with all of the, um, you know, young folks with their 
different ethnicities and nationalities. And so what I realized then was that all oh, these corporations are actually paying attention to the social movement, right? But they're actually not, you know, taking that part of the social movements that were about the critique of capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, they're taking that part of the social movements that's about the sort of dissemination, the branding of like minority cultures and minority difference, you know, to the exclusion of the question of like redistribution, right? And so that was what I also started to notice was going on around me, you know, and also at other institutions. You know, and at one point I you know, said in the talk, um, you know, about the book, right after the book that came out. You know, everybody's talking about, and I should say, you know, I cut my teeth as a grad student in California around the, um, thank you, uh, you know, the moments when, you know, George Lips is famous, they said that California was the Mississippi of the 1990s, right? So, you know, the first time I voted in California was um, the year that Proposition 187 um, occurred, and that was the anti-immigrant proposition. And I was naive, I was coming from our university in D.C., you know, predominantly black university, HBCU, and I thought, oh, there's no way people are going to deny people services because <laughs> they're immigrants. And it passed by a landslide, and I was like, what the hell have I got myself into? Like, what kind of state is this? And then, you know, two years after that, it was the anti-affirmative action proposition. And that didn't make any sense to me either. Again, I was coming from Howard University, 90% black students. You know, the other percentage people don't know this were actually South Asian students. Um, now, anyway, so um, again, I thought, well, there are no black people at UC San Diego. Black people were like 1.8%. And yet, we were telling themselves that like black folks, Latinos were all over and taking over. You know? And so, you know, I became part of activist efforts you know, to try and preserve affirmative action, it failed, as you know. Um, you know, but I say all that, you know, to say that one of the things I began to notice as a faculty member was that everybody was talking about diversity, diversity, diversity. And, you know, whether it be like the chancellors, the provosts, or the chairs and the deans, and you couldn't put your hand on where the diversity was, you know? Everybody's saying diversity, 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 and all of you know something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and even when there's the diversity, I mean, the part of your thesis, I think, which is so powerful, is to, to get us beyond this idea of cosmetic diversity, that representation exactly. alone. I mean, after all, we now have a black president, oh, right? Exactly. We have Clarence Thomas yeah. on the Supreme Court, yeah, yeah. We have all yeah. kinds yeah. of brown yeah. places yeah. in places. Black Lives Matter is all in the Yes. Just last night. Just the other night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so representation, yeah, representation alone is exactly. not, yeah. Right. yeah. So you, you use that term, I was just, Rod's book, which you should all read, is just he's such an eloquent writer. Um, but you talk about the, the technologies of power using difference, right? Um, and, you know, just so, so, so it's, it's using difference as a cover. It's using difference to sort of, you know, use, using diversity rather as a concession yeah. when that wasn't the demand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the critical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The demand was to have actual people of color and also to change you know, the organization of knowledge. Right. You know, like it wasn't about, you know, some disembodied diversity where you could, you know, talk about sort of diversity, but there were no, you know, people of color or black people in the room. You know, or on the faculty, like, yeah, you know, like that was the redistributive charge. Both redistribution in terms of we have got to open the doors, you know, and hold the doors open. And opening the doors also means reorganizing knowledge. It cannot be, you know, the syllabus the way it used to be. It cannot be the curriculum the way it used to be. It cannot be publications the way it used to be, like, all of those things have to change. There has to be a reconstitution in terms of what counts as knowledge and also the knowledge makers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, that so <laughs> resonates. Yes. Thank you. And I think that is what's so troubling when, when there are demands around transformation in the academy. And I, I mean, it's also understanding the nature of the university and our society that helps us to understand that it plays a role in reinscribing power relations. Yeah. Always, right? Historically, has has done that. So we kind of sometimes have these romantic 
um, notions of it. But oftentimes people say, well, we're, perfect, we're, we're achieving diversity, but we're doing it in preserving excellence. And what that signals to me so often is, don't do things differently, right? You can move in, but don't bring your stuff. You can move in, but don't do things around, you know? So, so that's a kind of brand of diversity that you want. But your, your book is also optimistic in that you look at, um, and I, that wonderful quote, mm -hmm. which, I, which I wrote down several times. Um, uh, at one point in, in Reorder of Things, Rod, Rod writes this, um, and this is a sort of, he does this, this um, layered indictment, right, of the ways in which interdisciplinary programs and the demand for diversity has been co-opted and, and is in danger of you know, wholesale co-optation. Um, but then looking at student movements and looking at women of color feminism in particular, which I'll ask you how you think that's playing out too. But he writes, uh, we must retain and elaborate an awareness of the contradictory nature of modes of difference as a way to simultaneously appreciate and evaluate our radical vulnerability and as a means of imagining strategies of intervention to create fissures and make room for the inadmissible. I love that. <laughs> to make room for the inadmissible. So what is inadmissible? Well, I mean, the inadmissible, I mean, you know, I mean, what are they saying? It's what, what, is, what has been created as the inadmissible thing? Well, I, mean, I think like, you know, it's really the, it's the idea that minorities can be knowledge makers. You know, I mean, you think about like, you know, just all those statistics about, you know, the number of like black and Latinos who are in prison versus the number that are in university. Like, you know, that is, a willful closure of intellectual possibilities for blacks and Latinos. Like it's, you know, it's, I mean, there you have just a naked inadmissibility, mm -hmm. right? You know, we won't let you in, not in this place. We will let you in another place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, so I think that's one, but also think that, you know, at the level of knowledge, you know, the inadmissible is also about, you know, how do we reconstitute, you know, what it means to do ethnic studies, what it means to do gender and women studies, what it means to do, you know, queer studies, so that it is about both, you know, changing the organization of knowledge, but also, again, holding the door open for, like, new types of people and communities to form, you know, in these places. Right? Mm -hmm. and like, I remember once when um, you know, I did this uh, keynote at the uh, Canadian Cultural Studies Association, and I went to a panel after my keynote, and one of the panels was a young grad student, an autistic woman, who was talking about, you know, and kind of imagine what an autistic classroom <laughs> would look like, full of autistic students. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, that's it. Like, what would, you know, that space look like if it were reorganized around disabled subjects, mm -hmm. right? People. But also, what would organize knowledge? How would that have to be reorganized? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, then to account for, you know, the ableism, you know, within, you know, say, political fear, or the ableism within, you know, a variety of different knowledge formations, right? So that, like, bring the people in is also, you know, you're also saying, okay, knowledge has to change. I mean, that was one of the things that we said, I dedicate the book to this group that I um, helped form when we were junior faculty at Minnesota. It was the Faculty of Color Initiative on both sides. And one of the things we said to the deans is that, okay, you have an issue with people of color. You ain't got that, right? And um, we can help you with that. But we said to them, you must understand, this is not simply about bringing bodies mm. into the university. You're bringing intellectuals of color. So the conversation has to be about how do we produce environments that will sustain the specific needs of intellectuals of color. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, that. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's, um, you know, and, and, and just hearing you articulate it, I mean, there are two things that come to mind. One is kind of one of my lessons from the way Ella Baker worked in movement organizations was as an outsider within. That she was, you know, people always describe her as a difficult woman, right? So she was, 
she was not the team player who was always nodding and trying to sort of get to the next level to get to the inner tier, but she was always looking out and saying, who's not in the room? And I think that's part of our job, well, you know, to be outsiders within exactly. and not be too comfortable or acclimated. Yeah. And the other is, of course, Edward Said's lessons yeah. about being an insurgent intellectual. Well, right. Right. Um, and, and being an intellectual as, as something different than necessarily being an academic. Well, well, an yeah. academic is a worker in a university well, right. that's following the rules to get certain of the rewards that right. the institution provides, right? Mm. An intellectual is trying to solve mm. dilemmas mm. that mm. the world does, right? Needs interrogating power. Oh, okay. um, and, and I think that's a different, um, you know, a different model. Yeah, yeah. yeah you asked me about, you know, my investments in women of color feminism, yeah. you know, and also within that, um, one component of that, and of course black feminism. You know, if you think about the sort of uh, historic relationship that women of color feminists have had to, like, for instance, the women's movement, but also to uh, the anti-racist movements. And then you mentioned the Combined River Collective. There's a wonderful line in there where they say that we are, basically, we are not your garden variety Marxists, <laughs> you know. That we think we are, we appreciate much of what Marx wrote, but we do not believe that class is the only explanation, you know, for our social world. And so I have always taken from that inspiration, you know, that um, you know to be in a place also means that or a location means that you also can critique it, you know, and have an obligation to and it. have an obligation to critique it, you know, to you know produce more of what might be possible in that place that the place never intended, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like you see that, you know, as you were saying, in um, you know, what folks are trying to do, feminists, queer, trans folks trying to do with Black Lives Matter, and also, you know, allies. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, I remember when um, last December I was in D.C., you know, visiting family, and I was with um, one of my best friends, um, partner and then we're at a restaurant and then we noticed outside the restaurant there was a line. This is at night and we said what a line a march, you know, going past. And we thought, well, what's that? Maybe we should get get into it. <laughs> <laughs> and we joined the march. It was a Black Lives Matter March. What, so you were, what time were you in? DC. Okay. What was extraordinary and I thought, okay, this is I've never seen this happen. When they did the chant about Black Lives Matter. It was all, it was, you know, we are queer, that matters. Mm -hmm. We are trans, that matters. You know, that had never, I've never seen that happen in, and I've been in a lot of marches, you know, mm -hmm. anti racist mm -hmm. protests where, you know, you establish the ground rule as, you know, a gender and sexual diversity. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, I, I think that the, the powerful um, intersectional analysis of, that is at the core of this movement, um, the willingness to indict state power in, in its sort of most rawest form, you know, is um, is a real power, is a real um, amazing feature of this movement, and it's also made it vulnerable. Yeah. Um, that that people are under attack, people are getting. You know, recently, um, Jasmine Abdullah in California got a, a felony conviction for attempting to prevent a protester from being uh, arrested. You know, Josh Williams, an activist out of Ferguson, is doing a felony conviction for participation in protests there. So, and I, and I, I also want us to take very seriously this very frightening political moment that we're in. I mean, that we talk about um, the the. Presidential elections, kind of in a different, and maybe we try not to talk about it because it's so depressing and surface-like at times. But, but, but I see a direct connection between the movement for Black Lives and uh, what has emerged as a xenophobic uh, um, movement coming center stage in the form of the presidential election. I think it is in part a a hateful response to the assertion of a, a new black politic, which is linked to immigration rights, which is linked to um, indigenous rights, which is linked to queer um, uh, rights, and so forth. And and that there's a real contestation and a real struggle in very high stakes at this moment. They go beyond the election. It's not just about you know whether Trump is defeated or not. Um, but 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 a movement has been unleashed in response to this to this hopeful movement of, yeah. of, of young people. So yeah. we have to be mindful of that and strategies have to reflect that. And I think that's, I mean, part of our work 
I think part of what happens in the academy is um, that it uh, creates false symmetry between certain kinds of um, ideas, right? To sort of say, you know, all ideas are equal. It's a free marketplace of ideas, which of course that's never true. Um, but also to encourage intellectuals and academics to not take sides. You know, that, that a kind of bloodless objectivism ought to define our work. So people who have the greatest access to information, right, are told to stay on the sidelines of history, and I think you have to reject that message. No, I think that's absolutely right. I've been teaching um, this semester a history of black radical thought um, class, which has a grandiose title from back, back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the courses that I took in undergrad at Howard, like history of social thought. Um, and so I thought, you know, let's just take some of that green back. Um, and, you know, and I, you know, I told my students, you know, I think of myself as one of those old Negro teachers, you know, that whatever I teach you, I'm... He's a lot younger than you. No, it's all right. <laughs> but whatever I teach you, I grew up in segregated Georgia, okay, so I, in rural Georgia. So whatever I, so I have those folks. And whatever I teach you, whether it's theory, whether it's, um, you know, literary criticism, the foundation of it, I'm supposed to teach you how to read and write. So uh, what I've said to them is that this class, History of Black Radical Thought, is really about the rudiments of the Black Radical Tradition, you know, almost like the ABCs of the Black Radical Tradition. And, you know, precisely this, that, you know, one of the rudiments is that, you know, you don't get to stay on the sidelines. You're always claimed, even when you think you're not, mm -hmm. you know? Um, that you're always participating, even when you um, have sort of surrendered to a romantic notion that you know you are not a participant. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. like, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Never been more true mm -hmm. than today. Uh, so Lisa is holding up a sign that says five minutes. So I'm wondering, do, should we take a few questions or yeah? Yeah. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Can you see? Yeah. Uh, so we've been, I've been enjoying this, you know, it's a luxury. We're always so busily moving through our lives, even though we have offices, we have offices down on the same floor. floor. <laughs> so it's good, to, it's good to come here with all of you and have this conversation with each other. But you've been sitting so patiently. If there were one or two questions before we turn the stage over to another very distinguished guest, um, we'd be happy to take them. Yes. So um, I found myself thinking as you were talking about, about two particular groups in, in higher education at the moment. And um, one is the group of diverse faculty that Yale just hired. And uh, I, uh, I fear for them. Um, and the other is um, I work at an institution that brings in 30% foreign students largely from Asia who are faced with uh, mistreatment and xenophobia by their institution once they've paid their money to be there. And so, um, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, again, this kind of odd moment where this diversity is coming in <laughs> and going out. And so I, I'm just one interested to hear what you have to say about these two examples at this interesting moment. Yeah, well, the situation at Yale and a number of um, places that have made concessions recently to diversity, I mean, I think it's an extension of what we've um, been talking about in terms of a kind of cosmetic diversity, right? That, that um, what Yale has done and what Brown has done, a number of places that have done some hiring initiatives recently, I mean, it's not welcoming people in with a different epistemology or people coming in that are going to um, redefine the way that research is, is done. And, and some of the people they're hiring, I'm sure, are brilliant people, probably some of the people we know and all of that, but they're still working within the confines of an institution that hasn't come to grips with its own sort of racist past, right? And one of the, actually two of the people at my meeting the other day what were, pe were people actually from Yale, and, and um, one person we're working with is Craig Wilder, who has done this book, Ebony and Ivy, about the, the racist history of the Ivy Leagues. But then also bringing it up to the 20th and 21st century, the relationship of Yale to the New Haven community. You know, Yale's a non-profit, uh, non so universities don't pay taxes, but they're rich institutions, right, and often in communities that are suffering. And so until we start indicting all of that and all the structures and not just navigating career paths, 
I mean, we haven't really struck to the heart of the problem. And so, you know, I mean, that, that would be my, my response to that question, which is not unique to Yale. Well, you know, it's also it reminded me of, um, you know, kind of crossroads that we had with the Faculty of Color Initiative at Minnesota. Um, you know, early on, we started in uh, 2000. So a year before the 911 attacks, right? And then after the 911 attacks, one of our members, one of the founding members, was deported, you know, Sri Lankan guy. And then he was allowed to come back and they cut off, you know, his uh, paycheck. Hmm. Okay. And you know, it was very important for us to say that look, we don't actually accept the institution's understanding of diversity, you know, which only means, you know, citizens. Right? That you know, our understanding, which is a coalitional one, means that we have to also find ways to protect you know, vulnerable international faculty and international students. So one of the things that we did you know, with, with this um, colleague was that you know, we bought his grocery. We paid, you know, we to pay the rent. You know? And that was part of our politics. You know? But if we had surrendered to institutions understanding of diversity. There's no way in which international faculty, our international students, our people of color, as if they don't have their own histories of race and empire, you know? Yeah, laughable. Um, and so, you know, I mean, so it's a moment that also requires that, that we have a sort of a political vision that's actually broader than the one that's, you know, given to us by the institution and also critical of that vision and provides an alternative to those visions. Another question. Okay. Um, I completely agree that one of the beautiful and maybe interesting differences between this reiteration of the movement um, to, the, to those in the past who moved um, for black liberation is the centering of queerness, right? Um, but I've had some humbling conversations with black folks um, and with other folks of color uh, about pushback around yeah. the centering of queerness. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering your thoughts on that, right? And perhaps um, for some <coughs> sentiment of optimism, if you've had any examples of conversations where people have evolved with this negative sentiment of queerness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Yes, I mean, I mean, so yes to your second question, I can give you an example or some examples. And, and the first question is, I think the terrain of struggle has changed. I mean, in the sense of, you think of a Bayard Rustin in the civil rights era, who was really in service to the movement but forced in, in the closet. I mean, it wasn't a debate, it wasn't, people weren't sitting around saying, you know, uh, Bayard, you think you shouldn't be so out front. People were basically saying, don't show your face. Um, and, and that was understood. So I think the, the, the assertion of leadership by folks with queer politics, and there's a bigger discussion about, you know, simple, in the same way that simple representation of brown bodies doesn't mean a radical transformative politic, simple representation of queer bodies, I think, means something, but doesn't necessarily mean um, a radical politic, right? But the fact that there has been an embrace of, of queer politics, it, a number of prominent organizations in the movement means that that's the debate. Now, some of the folks in Ferguson said they were afraid when they were on, you know, out in the street. They were more afraid of some people, you know, of our people in the crowd who were homophobic than they were of the cops. And so that reality coexists with a very out public queer, uh, black queer leadership. And that's, you know, yeah, that's the world we, you know, you know we still live in this world, right? Um, but the fact that that is a part of the terrain of struggle, I think, um, represents something going forward. The uh, movement for Black Lives convening in Cleveland last year, um, I don't know if you were there, but, um, I, you know, I do feel like there were people in my generation who I think got a real education um, about black feminism, about uh, queer politics through that. I think they moved on questions that, you know, I've been in, <laughs> People I've been in struggle with for 20, 30 years who are, you know, are using a different language. Uh, there are a lot of critiques to be made of that gathering, but that particular issue, I felt that I saw veterans in the movement um, feeling they needed to address a whole range of issues that they have not for decades. So I think that's some progress. Yeah, I also think that you know, part of it is like you know, identifying you know, 
the homophobic folks who are still have a bit of openness. You know, in other words, you can kind of, there's something there and you can reach them. You know, and they're out there. You know what I mean? Because I also think that this is a moment in which, you know, you can't actually ignore uh, your own homophobia. You know, you know, it's a moment in which, in which it's called into account in every, you know, circle. Like, so for instance, um, you know, one of my cousins sent me um, this text and she says, oh, mother just chastised one of the leaders at her church because this woman, had dis the, the woman kept silent when the husband disowned their son mm -hmm. for being queer and then fired him from the family business. Yeah. And my aunt is like one of the most able of the people I know. Okay? But like, you know, like she had the language and the tools, you know, to sort of make that kind of intervention. And I think that there are people, there are more people out there like that. And so the task has to be about, you know, how do we identify and reach them? The other people who you know, who do you hard, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. You know what? <laughs> but the folks who, you know, um, are questioning, you know, those you can make some headway with. And I think the lessons, we're, we're going to wrap up, I mean, the lessons of Rod's book about the co-optation of interdisciplinary programs in the academy is a lesson in every institution we work in, it's a lesson in every movement that we work in is that we can take a kind of superficial representation and mistake that for a substantive political change, uh, and we'll find ourselves, you know, in uh, a situation that we didn't anticipate and with a lot less progress than we hoped for. Uh, so I think that's a powerful lesson in your book that carries, that travels. Uh, I very much enjoyed this conversation, and let's continue. All right, thank you all.
Before giving Madam Sabrina the floor, may I remind you to please turn on your earpieces to follow her remarks. And thank you all. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christiane Tavir to the final plenary session of Imagining America 2016 as we close out. que les raisons liées à la misère, 
ou au changement climatique. Nous devons des solidarités à ces réfugiés, qu'ils soient d'origine syrienne, irakienne, libyenne, éthiopienne, soudanaise ou d'autres. Et finalement, je me suis arrêtée sur un autre sujet, parce que je le considère comme étant à la fois transversal et fondamental. C'est la question de l'accès à l'éducation publique et l'accès aux arts. C'est un sujet transversal parce qu'il se situe en amont de tous les sujets que je viens d'évoquer. L'éducation, l'accès à l'éducation est une condition essentielle, y compris pour être actif et utile dans les sujets que j'ai évoqués précédemment. Et c'est également un sujet fondamental, dans la mesure où il est la condition de tout le reste c'est-à-dire de l'accès au savoir et aux connaissances, c'est-à-dire des chances d'autonomie pour la personne, c'est-à-dire aussi de la possibilité de connaître ses droits et ses libertés et de pouvoir les exercer. La nécessité d'être en mesure de protéger les droits et les libertés des autres. Et bien entendu, l'accomplissement des obligations qui nous incombent et notre capacité individuelle à participer au destin commun. Il me semble donc que la question de l'éducation publique, de l'accès à l'éducation publique et aux arts est une question essentielle. L'enjeu est majeur. Il entend par éducation publique des standards minimums qui doivent être les mêmes sur l'ensemble du territoire. Mais j'entends aussi par éducation publique l'accès gratuit au savoir et aux connaissances. Parce que c'est l'éducation qui peut faire la différence sur les destinées des personnes. C'est l'éducation qui, en permettant l'émancipation, accorde à chacune, à chacun, de pouvoir connaître ses talents, développer ses talents, mettre en œuvre ses propres capacités. C'est l'éducation qui fait cette différence-là. Et si l'éducation ne fait pas cette différence-là, c'est l'argent qui fera la différence. Et la différence que l'argent fait, c'est la reproduction des inégalités sociales, mais c'est aussi de nourrir les dangers qui naissent des, de l'ignorance, des frustrations, des humiliations. C'est donc, de mon point de vue, l'éducation qui peut garantir d'abord une société paisible, qui peut assurer la vitalité de la démocratie, c'est aussi l'éducation qui nous permet de participer à notre avenir solidaire. Et puis, disons-le, c'est grâce à l'éducation et au niveau général d'éducation dans une société que nos sociétés peuvent rayonner. Et ce rayonnement collectif, il est dans la société, mais il est également à l'extérieur. Et la preuve de l'importance de l'éducation peut être donnée d'une certaine façon, par une illustration avec des exemples du contraire. Tous les systèmes d'oppression et de domination ont commencé par limiter ou interdire l'accès à l'éducation et au savoir. Sous le régime de la traite négrière et de l'esclavage, il était interdit d'apprendre à lire et à écrire aux esclaves. Et c'était interdit sous peine de punition pénale. Il y avait là donc un enjeu essentiel pour la survie de ce système d'oppression et de domination. Nous savons combien, comment pendant des années et dans de nombreuses sociétés, les petites filles ont été exclues de l'école. En tout cas, l'accès à l'école a été interdit pendant longtemps aux petites filles. De même, nous savons comment l'organisation de la transmission de la connaissance a exclu les pauvres, que ce soit les pauvres dans les milieux ruraux 
pour les pauvres dans les milieux urbains. L'accès à l'éducation est donc un accès essentiel parce que ceux qui ont besoin d'opprimer et de dominer commencent par interdire l'accès à l'éducation. De même, les systèmes d'émancipation et de libération sont des systèmes qui commencent par partager, transmettre du savoir. Par exemple, déjà sous la traite négrière et l'esclavage, c'est à travers l'enseignement de la Bible, Holy Bible, que les esclaves ont accédé à la lecture et à l'écriture. Et c'est dans les églises que l'émancipation et la libération ont commencé à se structurer sans compter la créativité que cela a produit, je pense évidemment au gospel, ainsi qu'au niveau spirituel. De même, les combats pour permettre la scolarisation des petites filles sont des combats démocratiques extrêmement importants. Enfin, l'accès des pauvres, que ce soit en milieu rural ou en milieu urbain, l'accès des pauvres à l'éducation est également un enjeu démocratique important. Et dans les luttes de libération, y compris dans les luttes syndicales, on voit bien comment souvent les syndicats eux-mêmes organisent d'abord des cours du soir, des cours d'alphabétisation, des cours de formation continue, afin de transmettre du savoir. Parce que nous savons que pour l'émancipation de l'individu, et pour lui donner la capacité de participer à la société, il est important qu'il ait accès à ses connaissances et à ce savoir. Et même dans un raisonnement économique, lorsque l'on considère d'une part ce que peut coûter l'accès à l'éducation et au savoir sur l'ensemble d'un territoire, et ce que peut coûter l'ignorance, le budget pour l'éducation est moins élevé que le coût social et financier de l'ignorance des frustrations, des humiliations et de tous ceux qui génèrent de nombreux désordres comportementaux. Victor Hugo, qui est un, vous savez, un grand écrivain français, qui s'est montré solidaire, notamment de John Brown, à l'époque de la lutte contre l'esclavage, et il a plaidé pour la libération et pour la grâce de John Brown, qui a malheureusement été quand même défendu. Victor Hugo disait « Ouvrez une école et vous fermerez une prison. » L'importance de l'éducation est donc perçue depuis très longtemps. Et si nous avons un combat collectif à mener partout, chacune, chacun dans nos pays respectifs, pour la démocratie, pour l'état de droit, pour une société plus fraternelle, pour un monde plus amical, je pense pour ma part que ce combat doit commencer par l'accès à l'éducation, par le partage du savoir et des connaissances. Quelques mots pour finir. J'ai beaucoup apprécié ces quelques jours que j'ai passés avec vous. Et j'ai entendu des choses brillantes, comme cet après-midi encore, lors de cette conférence, des intervenants éblouissants, comme les deux de cet après-midi qui ont dit des choses extrêmement intelligentes et fines. Et hier soir, j'ai assisté à la Wisconsin Black History Society à une performance qui s'appelait Precious Lives. C'est une performance qui traitait de la gun violence et qui était constituée de témoignages de personnes qui ont perdu des proches, des personnes chères, du fait de la folie des armes et du fait qu'il est plus facile de se procurer une arme que d'accéder à un médicament ou même de pouvoir se procurer un livre. Ces témoignages étaient extrêmement personnels, extrêmement intimes, extrêmement douloureux. Il y avait de l'art dans l'expression. Il y avait une très grande sensibilité dans les mots et dans les voix. C'était un moment très cathartique, c'est-à-dire utile pour les personnes qui témoignaient, y 
compris de façon artistique, mais c'était utile pour nous aussi qui étions dans l'assistance. J'ai ressenti cette, ce moment de communion collective parce qu'il y avait une invitation au partage, au partage de la souffrance, au partage de l'espoir, au partage de la combativité. Et dans cet exercice collectif, j'ai perçu un levier puissant pour que nous mettions ensemble nos énergies de façon à rendre nos sociétés plus fraternelles, à mieux nous comprendre entre nous, à mieux porter ensemble le monde, à mieux défaire les désordres du monde et à mieux répondre d'un monde qui nous ressemble davantage. Et j'ai pensé à ces mots de Maya Angelou. « We may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. » Merci.
Um, I am Milman Harrison, and um, um, I've done a lot of talking here this week, so I just want to say that we're just beyond excited. And to, um, to repeat of something I've been saying all week is that the world has changed, and we're gonna, we are so excited to have a part um, in, in, in making some change in our region and even on our campus, and it's just a wonderful moment. So thank you so much for choosing us. Uh, I'm Satirius Johnson. I'm very new to Davis, and I'm new to Imagining America, so I'm very, I've, I've just been blown away by these comments. I think we have big shoes to fill, but I'm sure we can fill them. Um, I, I, I have felt the, 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 the excitement on campus in the short time I've been there, and just as the news has gotten out about Imagine, Imagine America, and I, I know that uh, that's going to be a great conference because I believe in the power of the ag. Yeah. <laughs> Greetings everyone, Basha Watson, Director of Research and Policy for Equity at UC Davis. I'll just close with this. Our legacy is louder than the ivory tower. Older than borders that divided us into being something we are not. Somehow we forgot to put tongue in rightful place, use words to transform space. But we hear BS from privilege or poverty, we mouthful of poetry. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs>